down. This is uh, the last formal session of the year. Just a reminder that next week is our year-end event, so it's in the evening. It's in this building, uh, 6.30. The garage will be open, so there'll be free parking. We won't have a nuisance of having difficulty parking. And um, we'll have basically the, this whole first floor of the building for food and drink and events. <laughs> so uh, if you RSVP uh, that you were coming, please do, because we're catering for the number of people who said they were coming. So, uh, so this is uh, the last presentation of the year. Dan's going to present, uh, as it says here, an update on food allergy activities in Seattle. Mostly active research is going on here to change the face of how we manage food allergies. So Dan, thanks for coming, putting this together. Absolutely, thank you, Len. So this is has been in the past given by Dave Tillis, but uh, since I did last year, so I get to take over from now on. <laughs> so um, here's my disclosures. These are all this. I work with. They don't pay me any money, just help me with my studies. Um, so we're going to talk about the updates on food allergies and also some of the clinical stuff we can do with food allergies now, along with some of the updates of, of the top line data from the phase threes that have come out very recently. Um, so the problem, so uh, estimates are up to 15 million Americans have true food allergy with 4% of adults and 8% of children. This is across the, uh, uh, the Western world, so it's just, these numbers also reflect what what we see in Europe as well as in Australia. Australia is up to like 10% of kids have it. Um, between 1997 and 2011, there was a 50% increase. Um, and then the top allergens, as we all know, we take care of this. And it costs a lot of money. There's a lot of ER visits and a lot of doctor care that goes into it. Um, so 2008, there were 6,000 office visits for food allergies uh, with a diagnosis code 33% at Northwest Asthma and Allergy. 2016, 60%, over 13,000. Graphically, I just, for a paper we see I just, just sent to the, uh, to the annals, this is what it looks like for each the one, between when we first got EMR in 2006 to 2017. Um, about three times the amount from then to now. And basically, this is reflective of the country at large. So this is a issue that is growing and growing every year that we go forward. So what are the current treatment options? Uh, avoidance, counsel on cross activity, Nephrim, that's the standard care. There's the off-label homebrew treatments that some people are doing around the country, some. And then wait for an FDA treatment option. That's what we're going to be talking about in the trials that we're conducting here in Seattle. What do you mean by homebrew? <laughs> so um, people measure out small amounts of the allergen in their office, and then they give oral desensitization. So um, they make it themselves. And so they have scales and little bits of powder that they, they desensitize their patients to. Um, so a lot of so groups are doing this. So what's being investigated right now? So you have the epicutaneous, uh, the peanut patch, the milk patch, we'll talk about that. The oral immunotherapy trials, gene therapy trials, we'll also talk about that. And then there's the oral immunotherapy plus a biologic modifier. There's the anti-IgE, which has been studied. And then there's a newer one with the anti-IL-4 receptor antagonist. And then immunotherapy plus an adjuvant type. So. All right. So the goal, really, of the current clinical trials is purely desensitization. So a change in the threshold dose of the food needed to cause our allergic reaction. This is, they're not meant for, like, the peanut desensitization trials and the patches and everything that I'll be talking about. These are not meant for them to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It's not meant for any of that. It's just meant for that if they accidentally consume something um, in, a hidden, in a hidden product that they're gonna, the threshold's going to be higher, so they hopefully won't react as bad, or if at all. Um, very common side effects doing this. But the ultimate goal, and hopefully we work towards this, is sustained run responsiveness, or aka cure. And that's, you're done, you don't, have, you don't have to worry about this food allergy, you can eat it and live as much as you want, whenever you want, anytime you want. That would be the ultimate thing that uh, people would like for food allergies to be cured of. And, but this is a very difficult thing to achieve, and so far it's very rare, even in the food industry. All right, so we know what these are. So right now, um, phase three studies are undergoing, and the top line data are going to be talked. I'll talk about today for the two big trials they're going through. Uh, the patches. 
So Vibes is something that we did here in Seattle at the Asthma Inc. Um, it was a phase two, along with the, um, the long-term follow-up. And then these are, all the, oops, these are all the active studies that are ongoing right now. The PEATS, which is the phase three, which is completed. And then the rollover for PEATS, which is called PEOPLE, as well as this um, add-on to, uh, to the PEOPLE study called the Realize study. The FDA wanted additional um, children on the patch, but it wasn't an efficacy study. They just wanted to make sure that the safety profile was so these, the Realize study in people, and as well as in Pepeats, they have to do food challenges. Realize they didn't have to do any food challenges. So these are not efficacy studies. These are just more, more, more patients on the patch, making sure it's safe. Um, in terms of milk, uh, currently we're still, um, on, we're in the miles, it's called miles phase two. We'll talk about miles in a little bit. Um, again, 2015, uh, we, we got one of the first patients and one of the last patients in November 2016. Um, and they, they're in their second year of treatment. All right, so what was Pepeats? Uh, it was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized phase three pivotal study uh, using the Viaskin peanut uh, patch and was only for ages four to 11. From the Vibe study, that was the only group that got better from it. The older kids didn't, as well as the adults. And it's 12 months of daily treatments of a 250 microgram patch or placebo. Um, and there was a two-year open-label follow-up to that as well. The primary endpoints were these. So if their initial challenge, challenge with their dose was less than 10 milligrams, they had to achieve 300 milligrams or above at their one month food challenge. If it was greater than 10, um, then, and at 12 months, they had to have a listening dose of over 1,000. So their, their dose that they reached, not their cumulative dose, but their dose that they get to, okay? How um, does that translate into like number of peanuts? So basically, 250 milligrams is a single peanut. Virginia peanuts from those bigger ones are a bit more, but the standard peanut is about 250 um, So the inclusion criteria, they had to have a positive unit cap along with a positive skin test greater than or uh, equal to six millimeters or eight millimeters depending on the age, and they had to react at the less than 300 milligrams in a protein dose at their initial challenge. Um, so, and then here's the phase three, as I mentioned to you, the realized study. Um, these were the criteria. It's a bit higher in the real-life study because they weren't doing entry food challenges. They wanted to have a much higher criteria. So quite a few of the patients that we screened actually screened failed because they didn't have the high enough immunocaps um, as well as skin prick testing to, to qualify. Um, so here's the current phase three uh, trial. So um, the data I'm going to be presenting to you guys is the year end. So the end of year, that's what they've completed. So one year of the placebo control trial. We're in this part right now. So we've had people complete their second year stuff right now. Oh, true. Yeah. Oh, this one. Is there a mouse up there? Yeah, there's a trying to. Oh. It's not coming up. I'm moving it. It's moving okay. <laughs> you see it moving. Either. I see it moving, but we don't. Okay. Okay, so here was the results of the uh, phase three Pepeats trial. Um, so the primary endpoint was the increase of that endpoint, depending on what their initial dose was. In the placebo group, it was 35.3% responded. In the placebo, it was 13.6% um, responded. Um, the 95% confidence interval, so because so many patients on placebo got better, it was actually a matter of maybe three or four patients who just on placebo happened to increase their listening dose. The 95% confidence interval wasn't met and so it did not meet that criteria. So it was a failure of the primary endpoint of the study. Um, they tried to, in their statistic analysis, they, they really kind of optimized to estimate how many people on placebo got better. And um, in their previous trials, it was you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight percent, and they were powered to get up to 12% to be okay to be on the placebo to get better, and it exceeded that. So 13.6% of the placebo got better, and that's why it didn't um, interesting enough, the secondary end goal, which is um, something that also they were looking at, is how much peanuts that they could con um, that they could uh, consume, which is the cumulative reactive dose. The active group had a mean um, about 900 milligrams or a median about 444, whereas placebo had a mean of about 360. Um, as well as and so the baseline went from 210 to 900, to 900 which was statistically significant. Um, so this was very disappointing for the uh, for the company. If you looked at the stock prices, it kind of went boom like that. Um, 
but there's a lot of kind of talk, kind of background stuff with the FDA because the other important thing is that it's extraordinarily safe. Um, most common problems that these kids had is local skin reactions. Um, there was no episodes of anaphylaxis attributed to this. Um, this continue rate was about 10%, but it was the same in both active and placebo. Most of the time for the discontinuation is just people just didn't want to stick with it. It wasn't because of uh, AEs. And so there is some talk that the FDA might say yes to this. Um, because um, really, really, when you look at like the VIPE stat and other data, the patch is not really a one-year treatment. It's more, it's a multi-year treatment, all right? So for instance, um, the folks in the realized treatment group, we have the ability to pull them out of the study and do challenges on them. I refuse to do challenges on somebody with one year of patch therapy because I know from the experience that we've had, not very many of them get better. But at the end of two years and three years, so from the VIPE setup, it was over 80% had, had an improvement at the end of two years. So I don't even bother talking to them saying, no, 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 we're not going to bother doing this. So I think the two-year data is going to be much more telling in terms of how, how efficacious the piece is rather than this one year, which I think the FDA takes into account, hopefully, to this. Um, but they are confident enough that they actually submitted their, um, their biologics license for this product. So they've are, they're going to be doing it in the second half of this year. So we'll talk more about it. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident from what I've heard in, in, the, in, the, in the areas that this is probably going to get approved. Is there precedence by the FDA that they, where the drugs failed their primary endpoint, where they've approved it? Uh, in recent years? Is this a, yeah. Or just the... Well, it, it seems like the Trump um, stuff has kind of helped in the favor of this for loosening up the FDA requirements. <laughs> um, so there, there might be some benefit to it. But that was part, one of the major things that they, they've been talking about in the administration is bringing up the FDA to allow more novel type treatments and not just being so rigid and, and stick worthy. Um, it, it just happens to be uh, like three patients got better on nothing. Um, that's really a, at the end of it. But Plus, yay for them. But like something like uh, grass yeah, tech, there, yeah, there's no alternative. How, how often is this patch put on and right. how, how long sure. does it stay we'll, on? Sure, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, about all that. that stuff because I think this is gonna, something that's going to be FDA approved, so there's something going to be uh, logistically going to be available to the people who are going to be practicing allergy in like a year or a year or two, okay? Um, so the AMI product, the peanut OIT, um, the Palisade trial, is the um, ARCO3 pivotal phase three, um, Asthma Inc. did it, as well as the BRI group did it. Um, this is all complete, and then the Palisade is the uh, ongoing um, rollover of the study. Um, in the same way, realized for the patches, um, the FDA wanted more people to be on it. Ramsey's was the equivalent to realize in this one. So Ramsey's was a, a, a safety where they brought in patients who uh, who were um, four to 17 years of age that they wanted to have increased number of pediatrics in the trial so that they could just do safety. No, no, it's not an FEC, so there is no challenges or anything. All right. So the target dose for the Palisade study was 300 milligrams. Uh, the entry was uh, greater than three millimeters with an imi cap of 0.35. Um, they had to, uh, there was a 42 week buildup um, with the primary endpoint, um, you actually from less than 100 to greater than 300. So in order to get enrolled in this during their, um, their peanut challenge, they had to react at the 100 milligram dose, not the 300 milligram dose, in contrast to the, the patch. And then to meet their end goal, that all they had to do was get to 300 or above, all right? Which is actually not hard if they were taking 300 every single day. Then their challenge at the end of it was to take 300 and above, which they, they kind of put it in their, their corner here. They kind of stacked the deck a little bit for themselves, which is better than the piece did. Um, so um, basically, this is the, um, the increasing dose. There is initial dose escalation where they come in and they get 0 0.5, 1, 3, um, all the way up to 12 milligrams cumulative on the first day. And they come back the next day and they start at 3 milligrams. And they come in every Q2 weeks for, a, for an up dose where they're observed for an hour and a half and they go up accordingly. And so they, during those two weeks, they have to take this daily every day at home. Um, and as I mentioned, the Ramsey study, the enrollment is completed. It's four to 17 year olds, and they just needed to have a documented diagnosis of food allergy with those higher uh, uh, unit caps. This was surprisingly hard to find because they needed to have a doctor's note that actually said peanut, peanut reactions. And in a lot of 
charts that we reviewed that actually was never in their chart, even though with the diagnosis of anaphylaxis of peanut, it's never actually described what happened and what it was. It was all attributed to the peanut skin test rather than something that actually happened. So we had quite a few screen, screen fills for that purpose, for that alone. Um, so here's the, the Palisade phase three data that was presented at Quad AI. Um, the blue, the light gray is the placebo group, and the blue is the AR101, which is the peanut immunotherapy. And you can see from the primary endpoint that 77% versus 8% met the primary endpoints. And then as the doses increased, so 600 to 1,000 milligrams, that's how many. So 50% um, uh, had a had a uh, single reactive, uh, had, a, had beyond 1,000 milligrams in the human reactive dose, which is actually a little higher than conventional wisdom. So prior to this, what most people assumed was that if you were tolerating 300 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams, it was safe to assume that you could tolerate double that, which is what most of the studies kind of bared out to this point. And so why, that's why a lot of groups prior to the Palisade um, and the private home OIT or the, or the kind of university-based ones would have doses in the 1,000, 2,000 milligram range to kind of account for the safety profile. So 300 milligrams was actually kind of an interesting thought process. Um, but they were questioning, all right, so you can eat two, basically two-ish peanuts. Is that enough for you to have protection? Well, quite a few of them, in, after just um, this uh, first year of therapy, 50% got above 1,000. So three, over three times their amount, which was actually quite it was very interesting. Um, so the symptom severity uh, of at the um, at the uh, at the exit challenges for the first first uh, first year course of therapy, the top is placebo, the bottom is AR101, and so the different bars, so the yellow and the red, is the different severity of the reactions that they had occurred at the relative dose, uh, going from three milligrams to a thousand milligrams, which is the end dose. And you can see that the reactivity as well as the severity of reactions was much higher in the placebo versus the uh, the treatment treatment group itself. Um, reasons for discontinuation. So um, there was an overall about a 20% withdrawal rate from the Palisade study, which was about what we've seen in the prior studies for oral immunotherapy. It's about 20% kind of across the board. Um, the most common reason for withdrawal was related to GI complaints, abdominal pain, vomiting, persistent abdominal pain, which is about 6.7%. Um, Jonathan Spurl and I just published a paper about this kind of an EOE-like phenomenon with the abdominal pain as well as the vomiting, all those type of symptoms that you would associate with EOE that was, that was linked towards oral immunotherapy. And we took, a, did a meta-analysis of all the studies that had been published and all the, the reasonable data that was published, and we actually got the exact same number. It was 6.7% with all the studies that put together. So it was, I was happy to get that validated too. Um, but Has they documented EOE in some of those patients? In those patients, in the in our in a big study, yes, absolutely. In this one, uh, I think it's one one patient. Um, but but it's interesting. One of the things that uh, Jonathan and I were looking at is how long after the symptoms develop, uh, when and how long you have to wait for, and what time to kind of diagnose because it can happen at any point. So we they were detecting a year afterwards. Um, but for these patients in the Palisade study, once they get past their exit and one month afterwards, they stop looking at them. So I personally, we've had a few patients who got diagnosed with EOE and they're not included in this data set. Um, and so they're, we've told them, but they were outside the study at that point. Um, but I think it was related to the drug itself. And um, um, one question yeah. probably across all these kinds of studies, are the very most severe life-threatening, people who have had life-threatening is excluded from entry? Yes. So with the exception of the PEATS, um, so the, um, with the realized study, they allowed a grade 4. So you could have grade 4 anaphylaxis with the patch study, uh, with the safety patch study, not for the food challenges. We weren't interested in challenging anybody with that, that high level of um, anaphylaxis. But for this, you had to have grade 3 or less. So if you had more than two EPIs, you were not allowed to do this. If you're admitted to the hospital, any sort of like severe cardiovascular compromise, you were not permitted to do this. So there was some cherry picking to this as well. Um, they, uh, um, in, in this first go around, as opposed to the rollover stuff that, that came on afterwards, they reported that nobody had any epinephrine in this. I can tell you personally, we, I've given epinephrine to patients in this study. So but it happened in the 
not in the first part, but in the second part while they were on mainnet. So um, there's going to be more stuff about the safety profile. We'll talk about that in a little bit. All right. So um, the the Palisade clearly met its primary endpoint. So they haven't submitted their um, their application yet, but that's going to be soon in the not too distant future. So more than likely, the AMU product will become something that will be approved, along with probably most likely the DBB product. So in more than likely one or so years from now, there's going to be two products that are approved. So which one should be recommended to our patients? Um, so for in terms of office visits for the OIT, they're going to have to come in every two weeks for 20 to 36 weeks uh, with observation. So an hour and a half observation for these patients. Um, right now, currently, these are single doses, and so this can't be built under challenge. So um, these are going to be very not cost effective for us. So as, as allergists, we would be losing money every time we would see these patients, currently, how the current building thing is, is set up. And there's this very set dose escalation profile as well, right? You're also dependent on the patient themselves taking their dose every single day. Um, patients are run reliable uh, for doing this. And so this is immunotherapy. So if they say, I'm taking my dose every single day, and they're like, okay, let's updose you, and now they actually weren't, now you have a nice reaction in the office, all right? So it's very different than our conventional thoughts for immunotherapy, because everything, every time they come in for a shot, we know when they came in for their shot, and so we have that documented. Um, with the Bioskin for the uh, Epid, there's no specific interval that we have to see these patients. It's actually quite easy for these patients. These are um, usually, um, like in the study, we see them on their first day and then a month later to make sure everything is going okay. And then uh, six months later, and then a year later, it's, it's actually quite easy. Um, on call, um, so AR-101, if you wanna get woken up in the middle of the night, do AR-101, because you will be. Um, they will have reactions, um, every single one of them, and they're going to bug you and pester you. Right? Um, I was at a food immunotherapy talk where they were talking about the uh, positive and benefits of the different types of things, just like I'm doing right now. Um, right in the middle of it, I got a call about somebody having a reaction and needed to get epi. Okay. So, so yes, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a, definitely you're giving somebody who's allergic to something that they're doing every day at home, all right? Um, the bias kid, you're not gonna get called. Um, the age group that are most likely gonna be, uh, um, in this, that's gonna get approved, four to 17 for the AR-101 and four to 11 for the patch. So there's gonna be some differential um, what do you have to watch out for? Um, for the patch, um, you gotta take it off before they swim. Um, they can have some uh, skin rashes on their back, but that's really about it. Um, it's a pretty safe, uh, safe thing. Um, but with the oral immunotherapy, you have to be very cautious with these patients. So, um, and these are children. So um, they take their dose and they immediately go out and exercise or, or have, they're gonna have a reaction. I had that kid who was at camp, um, took, a, took his dose, immediately went to go play ultimate frisbee. Um, epi there, epi on the way to the uh, on the way to the hospital, and then to the hospital where they were getting steroids and everything. Um, hot showers too, so they can have these awful eutocaric reactions. So they take their dose, jump in a hot bath, boom. Um, they get sick, so even before they get sick, so in the prodromal viral stages, they can have reactions too, because their threshold, even though they were tolerating every single day, their 140 milligram dose, day before, and, and then all of a sudden they have a reaction, and next day they have a fever. So it's, um, it's a dicey thing. And also, NSAIDs can also potentiate these, these problems as well, okay? So there's a lot of cautions that you can do. Um, when we first were doing this, we were naive. Now that we've been doing this for a few years, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna kind of wired into it. But it's a lot of, uh, a lot of work to, to, to optimize these patients and make sure that you minimize your calls and their reactions. Um, so what are the advantages? Um, so with the AR-101, most patients reach their maintenance dose relatively easily, um, and you know what they're desensitized to. They're tolerating 300 milligrams. They are tolerating at least 300. Most likely they can tolerate 600. And so you definitely know that they're gonna have some protection from this product. The Bioskin Peanut, you have really no real idea what exactly their um, threshold dose, unless you challenge them. So, um, so if you do two years of therapy, and that's my, my thoughts about how you can do this, is that you do this for two years and you do a peanut challenge and see how high you can get to a reasonable, reasonable degree. You don't push them too far high, but you kind of figure that out. Um, 
there's a lot. They're, they're nice in that terms. There's no up, no up dosing visits. Um, systemic side effects very rare, and you do get some protection after a certain amount of time. Um, what are the disadvantages? Well, as I mentioned throughout this entire time, the two weak things: the anaphylaxis with their with the and then the GI side effects. And then up to 20% of patients just cannot tolerate, just don't want to do it. Um, it's interesting. While AEs and adverse events do do significant are significant stoppage points, there are some kids who just don't want to do this. This actually becomes a stressful point for them in their lives. Um, it's mostly the parents who are driving this, and they just, they hate it. They hate the taste of it. They don't want to do it, but you're making them do it every single day. So just think about a food that you hate, all right? And now, <laughs> eat it every day, all right? And for you, this is not something that can be life-threatening. For you, it's just, I don't like that. But just think about that and the stress that you can so for the young kids, it's usually not a problem, but for the teenagers, it can be a significant life stressor for them. And we've had to send some kids to a therapist um, for this very reason. I, and I'm not joking about this. Um, I, I, have, I have a beeline to a few of these guys around town to, to get these people in because they have significant side of this, um, psychiatric issues because of this. And we just have to stop it um, because it's just too much for them. Um, so the bias skin, um, up to a third of patients have no benefit in the first year. Um, and as I mentioned, the efficacy we don't know unless we actually do the challenge itself. Dan has a question. Do you know yeah. in the phase two studies with the bias skin, yeah. I'm presuming that it, like 500 or 1,000 micrograms wasn't tolerated well? They didn't that, go that high. And yeah. I mean, I wonder why not. Yeah, so their top dose. I guess they was, didn't know the result. <laughs> yeah, their, their top dose was 250. Interesting. So that's, what, that's how high they went. They're actively looking the, uh, for oh. the older children and older, older well, especially adults. if eighty percent of patients have some effect, that yeah. may be. So Dan, yeah. clearly your bias in the way you're presenting this is <laughs> oral immunotherapy is got so many disadvantages. Even though it may come to market, it doesn't sound like most people are going to want to put themselves or the <coughs> patients through it. So the patch may be the more realistic thing, it's, it, but it's a narrow age group. And so, um, I, 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 I tell you all this for full disclosure, but that's the practical thing about being an OIT doctor using this product for the last two years of doing this. Um, there are, but there are quite a few patients who do, who do like this, who do well, and um, are, are converted to other things, and they do quite well with this, and they're very happy with this. But it's, it's where the age group and the type of patients that you pick. So this is not for everybody listening to Dalvi, for, for darn sure. I'm sure the company would love to have everybody on everybody on this medication. It's absolutely not the case. This is for very select people who are responsible, thoughtful, and that the kid has to be okay with it. Um, and so there's some people where a patch is far superior, where others, I think, don't stay away. Here's an epidemic. Um, which is kind of the feelings for a lot of you, especially the adults. Uh, it's interesting. Almost all the adults stop uh, with this stuff. They don't continue. So uh, it sounds like many more people, you know, once it becomes clinically something you can prescribe, would elect to do the patch. Mostly, you'd be advertising it to them, protecting them against anaphylaxis from a small inadvertent ingestion. Yes. So do you have some sense for how many, what amount of peanut ingestion it would protect them from? Oh, it's variable between the person, so that, that's the thing about the patch, is that you don't know unless you do it in the person. So even even at the end of two or three years, it was still 17, 20% who did not respond to the patch. So, uh, so that's that's definitely a, a kind of a hedge point. So some people definitely want to know how much I can take, and other people are like, well, it's a hassle of doing all that stuff. I'll just stop the patch when it comes back, and that should help. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the other um, Product from this company. The MILE study was a milk um, epicutaneous surgery, that's in the phase two, and they needed to have uh, these criteria greater than six millimeters, greater than 10 amid a cap, um, and then it was dose ranging since it was phase two. They started at 150, 300, 500 micrograms versus placebo, and the primary endpoint end was either a tenfold increase or a cumulative reactive dose of 1.4 grams of of milk protein, just to give you an idea, eight grams is a typical cup of milk. 
last month. Um, we have completed our enrollment. So 308 were screened, 110 screen failed. Um, quite a few of them was because of the internet cap. That was the most, most dominant one that uh, reason that people were not enrolled in the study. Um, 189 got to the randomization stage, and then 187 went into the open label portion of it. Um, all right, so the three different treatment arms, 150, 300, 500, that will come, that will be important in a moment. Uh, they have completed their one year look at this, and the most interesting thing was the fact that the um, 300 microgram dose was the most effective one as opposed to the 500 and 150. There was no clinically significant improvement at the higher doses, 500 versus the 150. The 300 micrograms was the best one. Uh, and then the human reactive dose also reflects this as well. So a median of 1.4 milligram, 1.4 uh, grams, uh, with a uh, total of 1.5 grams for the 300 as opposed to the 500, 150. Um, the problem was is that at the end of their end of their first year, they did what they basically because there was such a lag in reviewing <coughs> these patients. So the very first patient that was in the study had finished by the time the last patient had started. So they didn't know what the optimal dose was. So they put everybody on year two, assuming it was going to be the same as the Bioskin peanut, on the high dose of 500 micrograms. Um, so this, so we have an entire year of people on the on the less efficacious dose, and so because of that, they have um, basically put the study on a bit of a hold right now. So all the challenges that we were supposed to do for the year twos have been stopped, and now they're revamping and going to shift everybody to the three hundreds. So it's a little bit of a mess, um, but they 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 had some signal in this, so it was it was interesting. But uh, but there's some some challenges with the study. Company has had a lot of challenges over the last uh, year and a half. Um, also reflective in their stock price. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, but it's, it was a very uh, again the no SAEs, very safe profile. This was a was, was a very interesting thing. It was a very easy thing to do. The same idea as the, the Pete uh, stuff. But uh, it, and from from what I saw from these patients, they, they did quite well for the ones that were the responders. All right, so what about some, the, some yeah. speculation why the higher dose yeah, wasn't as good? What were some of the things thrown around? They, they don't know yet. They're, they're still kind of contemplating that. Uh, this is just stuff that just came out just a, just a couple, like a month or two ago. So all this, all this kind of fallout out from it. They don't, they don't know. Is this, this is, a, is this really worth doing? Don't most kids, I'm not a pediatrician, yes. outgrow milk allergy anyway? Most kids do, but there's quite a few who don't, and so and that's actually increasing in rate. So the pro conventional wisdom was 20% don't, 80% uh, outgrow it, 20% don't. That's actually decreasing. So the the amount that's keep, keeping in persistence into adulthood is going up, um, and up and up. And the number of kids, just last week I saw how many 13, 14 year olds with like still true milk allergic, can't do baked goods, can't do anything. So these were like no baked goods, no 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 milk products whatsoever that were in this study. So and the people who could tolerate break milk had low immunocaps, and that's usually the kind of the sign that things are going well. And that's usually what I tell patients that it it's a bad signal, if a bad sign if you can't tolerate any baked goods at any point. And I'm probably not going to grow out of it. All right, so I well, talked about like the convention stuff at um, phase three, but there's a whole lot of very interesting things that are, that are coming down the pipe that are, that are, we are enrolling here in, in uh, Seattle. So the phase one B site mentioned this last year, which is the peanut gene vaccine. Um, this is from a group, um, this is from Estellas. And this is a era lamp vaccine that's been encoded with the gen genes of era H1, 2, and 3 in our DNA plasma vaccine. Uh, we've currently completed enrollment. Um, as this was for adult peanut allergy only, and they had to they had to do a double blind placebo controlled uh, food trial. And speaking of, I have a challenge for this that I have to get to by eight, or like you. So, so I have to have two of these that I'm going to have to do later today. Um, one, and so, if you, one entry, one exit. So um, and so they had to have grade three or less anaphylaxis, and there's it was it was safe. So they're they're um, actually shifting down to twelve year olds. 
as a, as a next uh, go around. So they, uh, they're actually actively looking at right now. Um, we were their number one enroller um, from all over the country. So they, they're actually looking to us to like really kick this off. Um, I don't have any data from it because we're still ongoing. So, but this is the basic mechanism behind it. So um, DNA plasmid is injected directly into the muscle or, or um, into the dermis. And the idea is that it gets uptaken by the uh, by the mononuclear cells, and then somehow do this. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Uh, I was a little bit skeptical of this entire process. I didn't think uh, it worked this way, but uh, um, we'll see if it, it pans out. Um, the next uh, study that we we just started is a um, from the Hal Allergy Group, which is if you know European stuff. These are the alum-based guys who do all this alum-based therapy in Europe, and they've kind of jumped into the food immunotherapy world. So they're doing subcutaneous peanuts. And um, so those of us who are a little bit older um, and who know about the history of this, this, there's a lot of badness with subcutaneous <coughs> peanut injections. There was a death in uh, National Jewish in the mid-90s um, because of this, not because of this product, but subcutaneous peanut. There was nothing related to subcutaneous peanut. It was a pharmaceutical error where they gave somebody who was on placebo full dose peanut and then they died. Um, but that effectively derailed um, interventional studies in food immunotherapy for about 20 years. Um, so it's very brave of this company to like jump into this foray. Actually, I had a meeting with the CEO and the CFO of this country like because they they've done it in Europe and they're bringing it over here and um, like you guys are kind of going to the minefield because you're going to have to change a lot of minds and thoughts to, to, to do all this. Um, so this is going to be uh, eventually down to the uh, pediatric age group, all the way down to five. They're the first ones. They've already done the uh, 18 and above, and that was safe. No, no serious adverse events that happened there. Um, and so they're dropping it down to 12 right now, and that's what the cohort that we're enrolling right now to do in the first initial safety profile. No challenges for this group, so I have no efficacy data. They're doing the European basal activation style of testing for uh, for their food challenges. Um, so we will. So that's going to that's ongoing. We're going to have our basic our first patient's going to get their first injection tomorrow. Um, I think Len will be there helping to supervise things. So <laughs> yes, I know. I don't know right now. Um, but we are actively recruiting. So if there's if you have any patients who you think would be interested in doing this or participating in this, um, uh, please send them over. This is a big ask. All right. So what this study entails once a week of injection of this stuff with a four-hour observation. <laughs> um, so it, it is a significant ask. And so this is the adolescent group. Um, surprisingly, you know, these are this is a very motivated research group, so I, I thought nobody would say yes. We had a, we had a couple say yes. So um, we're still recruiting. Um, and then there's some interesting studies that we are about to embark on that um, we have not yet started yet. Um, the uh, next one for the DBV is the epitope study. We're going to be ch challenging the children with one to three-year-olds. Yay! Uh, so we're um, so it's going to be patches on, on toddlers, um, and we're going to do food challenges on toddlers. Oh, imagine my excitement for doing that. Um, but uh, yes, so we're we're going to be doing all that. But some of the more interesting ones that are going to be coming up um, is um, Dupilumab plus the Amy product. So the AR101 product I discussed, they're going to be tag teaming with, uh, with uh, Regeneron and um, using Dupilumab as an adjuvant. This is um, in, the, in the, a phase two study, which I think is going to be very interesting to see. It's going to be the first time Dupilumab plus food immunotherapy are going to be combined together. Um, we're also going to be doing a grass one too. So that, um, there's, there's a lot of great benefit from the Zolaire group. I'm, I'm curious how this one will go as well. And then uh, another one that's going to be using uh, adjuvant, adjuvant type therapy uh, is a TLR4 agonist therapy. Um, so TLR4, uh, this is the kind of the thought process which shifts the immune system away from TH2 towards TH1. Um, this is the, they've, they've used this as like adjuvant NPL and like, and, and like immunotherapy. This is the class. This is a uh, a, a product actually made here in, in Seattle uh, with a company called Immune Design, and they sold their rights for this type of therapy to Sanofi. Um, so it's an interesting thought process behind this. Also, it's going to be phase one and greater than 18 year olds, with the hope that tiny amounts of 
the peanut that we'll be exposing them to plus the adjuvant will get the same type of signal that we get with the higher doses. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Okay. So uh, I read this over 2017, meant for you 2018. So we have the high risk food challenge clinic that's still available. So um, staffed by the do some of the doctors here in this room. Um, this is available to anybody out there in the community who wants to send somebody for a high risk uh, food challenge. So if you're um, unsure that somebody's truly allergic or not, and you want to do, do the standard, which is a true true challenge, this is the way to do it in a safe place. They're they're given IVs. There's a one to one nursing care. It's done in a done in the hospital itself, and there's usually more doctors than there are um, patients. So all, all the fellows are there. It's, it's, a good, it's a good, safe place to do challenges. So if you have any question, and what I what I recommend to patients is that um, this is the time to do this is the transition points from from going to home to kindergarten to going to to like high school to to college and from middle school to high school. Do I need my EpiPen? Do I need to care about it? Do I do I need to do I need to like really be worried about this? And uh, challenges and I've heard this from parents can be very empowering for the families. Is that, that it's one of the more positive things that they can get from it because they can see how we respond to to a reaction, how we treat a reaction. And that it's epinephrine is not something to be scared of. Um, so this is something that uh, can be very, very uh, good for, for parents to see as well as the child to see. Because if they have a reaction, and they need epi, then they're especially the teenager. Like, yeah, I guess I should carry my epipen around. Kind of solidifies it in them. All right, uh, there's an example of room, but that's from before. I don't know where where it is now. Um, <laughs> this is the criteria for it: uh, 40, 20 years old. Um, Need to have recent testing, uh, must have stable controlled asthma, no beta blockers, and we do assortment of foods, both uh, in the pure and baked form of milk. Uh, and anybody who meets the above criteria can be sent in. So uh, be from pediatrics, gas, GI, or allergy you know, too. All right, so what's going on? So we have two ongoing phase three efficacy safety trials that are ongoing right now. We have about 70 patients in active food trials right now. We have a phase two epic trial that's going on right now. We have a phase 1B that's got about to go to adolescent, uh, phase 1B skits, uh, three new trials that are going to be initiated in the next few months. We have that high risk OFC. There's all sorts of fun stuff that's happening at BRI, which we should get one of those guys next year to present. So Eric, Eric Wambre or uh, one of those guys to present for next year. Um, they have some very cool stuff that I, don't, I want them to present next year at our, our forum day. And so there's lots of stuff that's happening right now. I mean, this is in dramatic contrast with a couple, few short years ago with the, where we just had vipes. So there's quite a bit of things that are happening right now, so it's quite exciting. All right, I've yacked mm -hmm. long enough. Yeah. Dan, at the meeting there was an intriguing poster about, I think it was a fusion protein of IL-22 and ARH2. So the idea is you target specific B cells that react to ARH2 and IL-22 and, and induces a, apoptosis of those cells only. That was pretty pretty intriguing. I'm trying to remember the company, but yeah. yeah. So. No, there, there's all sorts of interesting things that people are doing. There's this nanoparticle one, right. with these intranasal things that with like lipid with lipid floats and with like protein. And Jim Baker, I think, is doing that work in Michigan. It's it's pretty interesting stuff. There's, so you know, I, I get down on the, the these first generation, but it's the first options that we're going to have. These are the this is why I tell patients this is Mark One version one. Of the first ones, they're always going to be not ideal, a little bit crude, and so the next stages of things I think are going to be more efficacious, more effective, and hopefully get to the point where actually we can cure this rather than just desensitize it, um, because that's where most people want to be. Is they want to make this go away. They want to eat it whenever they want, if they want to. They don't want to, rather than choking it down every single day or having to put a patch on. Because maybe some of them. Right. Okay. In that so. um, National Jewish study that was. Yeah. Stop because of the fatality. Um, from what I remember, there was the people. There was a group that were on the sub Q that did well. That completed. Do I, I forget what the what the outcomes were? How it, dramatic? It was, a, do you, have they discussed that in the those, those original data? Because there was a handful of people that benefited from the sub Q peanut. Yes, but is it, it was a different product than what they're doing. So they're, they're using how down the allergenicity of the existing product, so it's not the same as what they were doing before. Um, 
and there was a lot of adverse events. So if you, if, uh, looking at the original paper, people were reacting all the time with their subcutaneous dosing. It seemed to pretty rough, you know, they were, they were, they were being kind of cowboy back then. Um, but it, it was definitely much more, many, much more adverse events um, in that state compared to the 18 and up group that they've done so far, both the, the ones in, in Europe as well as the, the preliminary one they did here in the U.S. It's interesting. And, uh, it's not part of your talk here, but those who are pediatricians especially, what do you see happening with, with the outcome of the LEAP study, how well it's being put into practice in our community? In the beginning, it seemed like, you know, beautiful work that was getting ignored by the pediatric community. It's getting better. So um, I, I've given several talks to the pediatric groups at large um, over the last couple of years. And the first time I talked about LEAP, um, this is what a, what a pediatrician told me who went to all three talks. She said, the first time you talked about giving six-month-olds, four- to six-month-olds, peanut, I thought you were crazy, so I stopped listening to you. Um, the second time I heard you talk, I heard you a little bit, but I didn't really follow through what you said. When I just gave a talk in earlier this year, she said, I think I'm going to do it now. So it like takes it. time. It's, it's, a, it's a massive culture change um, with these doctors. I mean, they've, you know, they've done this you know, for the last 20 or plus years where they've kind of this entire generation of doctors are, have done it and had this dogma of avoid, 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 avoid. And to shift to do something completely different is a uh, is challenging to say the least. Um, but just looking at the faces as I as I give this presentation, the hostility from that first talk to the nods on the, by the third talk was was pretty stark. <laughs> it was um, it, it was quite interesting. Um, but yes, so. Um, I, what I'm hearing from a lot of uh, my pediatric patients who are coming in, they are introducing things, and that's usually what brings them into the first place. Is rather than um, maybe he's allergic to it, this he had a rash when I gave him Bamba, which I rather see having a positive reaction history rather than testing just because. Do you, do you agree, Frank? Yeah. Well, it's, it's sort of analogous to when we, you know, the, the the data was out that MMR was safe to give in kids with. With egg allergy that took about a decade for that, for that to get acknowledged yeah, egg with and I, I, I agree it's exactly the first time I talked to three or four large groups they were like eh. and I guess the good news is we're probably getting referred to the highest risk group anyway in other words with severe eczema you know that sort of thing but I think more and more I'd say as much as 20% of parents are on they've already googled it and are, I know about the LEAP study and that sort of thing. So it's come a long way in three to four years, I'd say. Um, the higher rate for the placebo in the milk patch, is that just reflective of the fact that some people outgrow milk allergy? It's, it's, it's just an active history of milk bubble. And you have, to, you have to build that into yeah. those studies. The same thing will be for egg, too. Yeah. They, they just, kids just naturally outgrow that more likely than others. Are you guys doing LEAP challenges? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's interesting. I immune stock is up over a hundred percent though yes. since the data was released. Oh, so they don't yeah. care about you getting called at three in the morning. They do not. <laughs> or, or the tolerance <laughs> for the product. All they care is that it was a, a positive because result. The only thing I worry about is somebody doing it wrong and uh, yes. reacting yeah. so badly, and then that will derail all yeah. of this well, stuff. Like giving That's therapy what I in general. So, um, I've had lots of talks with the company about this very this, this very topic. Of have to like for all the experiences come forward. You need to have people out there to really discuss it with people to do this. You got to be comfortable with this. Um, this is different than skit, and that's a different animal altogether. And so there's a lot of challenges um, to doing this. And so a lot of people are, are going to be more comfortable since they have to be approved. But I'm not sure how many, especially the um, older generation, are going to be doing this. this Just got a curiosity. I the only guys who did you do this? Did you do oral immunotherapy? Not the way you do that. <laughs> 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 and the other concern is, right, you, you, you can get to a certain end point and then the kid gets sick and his threshold changes. Yes. And then a lot of non specific factors can make it even more unsafe. Puberty right. changes things too. So um, I had quite a few of my teenagers who are doing this. So reacting, not reacting, reacting, not reacting. Yeah, I, I guess the younger generation, you know, it's like everything in life. We're pretty inept with 
EMR and computing because we weren't brought up on it, and younger people are a piece of cake. So uh, the generation that are trained on this, once it's an existing product, it'll be part of what they're taught to do. But you didn't give, in my way of thinking, the most optimistic outlook on the first kind of product. Realistic, All right, so this is our last formal presentation. Um, if you have suggestions of either speakers or topics for next year, while this is in your mind's eye, send them to me because we need to come up with 30 plus presentations that are novel and educational, and that's a challenge in itself. And then again, uh, we look forward to everybody coming next week, Tuesday evening, same place for uh, our last session of the year. Bill has got awards and interesting stuff to say and do, and we're graduating some fellows into becoming